thrice commanded to do so. Eventually asking what he should read, he was further commanded in the name of a Lord who created man from a clot of blood. After the angel Gabriel, who so identified himself, had told Muhammad that he was to be Allah's messenger and had departed, Muhammad confided in his wife, Khadija. On their return to Mecca, she took him to meet her cousin, an elderly man named Waraka ibn Nufal, who knew the scriptures of the Jews and Christians. This whiskered veteran declared that the divine envoy who once visited Moses had come again to Mount Hira. From then on, Muhammad adopted the modest title of Slave of Allah, the latter word being simply the Arabic for God. The only people who at first took the smallest interest in Muhammad's claim were the greedy guardians of the temple at Mecca, who saw it as a threat to their pilgrimage business, and the studious Jews of Yathrib, a town 200 miles distant, who had been for some time proclaiming the advent of the Messiah. The first group became more threatening, and the second more friendly, as a result of which Muhammad made the journey, or Hajira, to Yathrib, which is now known as Medina. The date of the flight counts as the inauguration of the Muslim era. But as with the arrival of the Nazarene in Jewish Palestine, which began with so many cheerful heavenly auguries, this was all to end very badly, with the realization on the part of the Arabian Jews that they were faced with yet another disappointment, if not indeed another imposter. According to Karen Armstrong, one of the most sympathetic, not to say apologetic, analysts of Islam, the Arabs of the time had a wounded feeling that they had been left out of history. God had appeared to Christians and Jews, but he had sent the Arabs no prophet and no scripture in their own language. Thus, though she does not put it this way, the time for someone to have a local revelation was long overdue, and once having had it, Muhammad was not inclined to let it be criticized as second-hand by adherents of older faiths. The record of his 7th century career, like the books of the Old Testament, swiftly becomes an account of vicious quarrels between a few hundred or sometimes a few thousand unlearned villagers and townspeople, in which the finger of God was supposed to settle and determine the outcome of parochial disputes. As with the primeval bloodlettings of the Sinai and Canaan, which are likewise unattested by any independent evidence, millions of people have been held hostage ever since by the supposedly providential character of these ugly squabbles. There is some question as to whether Islam is a separate religion at all. It initially fulfilled a need among Arabs for a distinctive or special creed, and is forever identified with their language and their impressive later conquests, which, while not as striking as those of the young Alexander of Macedonia, certainly conveyed an idea of being backed by a divine will, until they petered out at the fringes of the Balkans and the Mediterranean. But Islam, when examined, is not much more than a rather obvious and ill-arranged set of plagiarisms, helping itself from earlier books and traditions as occasion appeared to require. Thus, far from being born in the clear light of history, as Ernest Renan so generously phrased it, Islam in its origins is just as shady and approximate as those from which it took its borrowings. It makes immense claims for itself, invokes prostrate submission or surrender as a maxim to its adherents, and demands deference and respect from non-believers into the bargain. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, in its teachings that can even begin to justify such arrogance and presumption. The Prophet died in the year 632 of our own approximate calendar. The first account of his life was set down a full 120 years later by Ibn Ishaq, whose original was lost and can only be consulted through its reworked form, authored by Ibn Hisham, who died in 834. Adding to this here saint obscurity, there is no agreed upon account of how the Prophet's followers assembled the Quran, or of how his various sayings, some of them written down by secretaries, became codified. And this familiar problem is further complicated, even more than in the Christian case, by the matter of succession. Unlike Jesus, who apparently undertook to return to earth very soon, and who, Pache, the absurd Dan Brown, left no known descendants, Muhammad was a general and a politician, and though unlike Alexander of Macedonia, a prolific father, left no instruction as to who was to take up his mantle. Quarrels over the leadership began almost as soon as he died, and so Islam had its first major schism between the Sunni and the Shia before it had even established itself as a system. We need take no side in the schism, except to point out that one at least of the schools of interpretation must be quite mistaken. And the initial identification of Islam with an earthly caliphate made up of disputatious contenders for the said mantle marked it from the very beginning as man-made. It is said by some Muslim authorities that during the first caliphate of Abu Bakr, immediately after Muhammad's death, concern arose that his orally transmitted words might be forgotten. So many Muslim soldiers had been killed in battle that the number who had the Quran safely lodged in their memories had become alarmingly small. It was therefore decided to assemble every living witness together with pieces of paper, stones, palm leaves, shoulder blades, ribs and bits of leather on which sayings had been scribbled, and give them to Zaid ibn Tabit, one of the Prophet's former secretaries, 
for an authoritative collation. Once this had been done, the believers had something like an authorized version. If true, this would date the Quran to a time fairly close to Muhammad's own life, but we swiftly discover that there is no certainty or agreement about the truth of the story. Some say that it was Ali, the fourth and not the first caliph, and the founder of Shiism, who had the idea. Many others, the Sunni majority, assert that it was Caliph Uthman, who reigned from 644 to 656, who made the finalized decision. Told by one of his generals that soldiers from different provinces were fighting over discrepant accounts of the Quran, Uthman ordered Zayib ibn Tabit to bring together the various texts, unify them, and have them transcribed into one. When this task was complete, Uthman ordered standard copies to be sent to Kufa, Basra, Damascus, and elsewhere, with a master copy retained in Medina. Uthman thus played the canonical role that had been taken in the standardization and purging and censorship of the Christian Bible by Irenaeus and by Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria. The role was called, and some texts were declared sacred and inerrant, while others became apocryphal. Outdoing Athanasius, Uthman ordered that all earlier and rival editions be destroyed. Even supposing this version of events to be correct, which would mean that no chance existed for scholars ever to determine or even dispute what really happened in Muhammad's time, Uthman's attempt to abolish disagreement was a vain one. The written Arabic language has two features that make it difficult for an outsider to learn. It uses dots to distinguish consonants like B and T, and in its original form it had no sign or symbol for short vowels, which could be rendered by various dashes or comma-type marks. Vastly different readings, even of Uthman's version, were enabled by these variations. Arabic script itself was not standardized until the later part of the ninth century, and in the meantime, the undotted and oddly voweled Quran was generating wildly different explanations of itself, as it still does. This might not matter in the case of the Iliad, but remember that we are supposed to be talking about the unalterable and final word of God. There is obviously a connection between the sheer feebleness of this claim and the absolutely fanatical certainty with which it is advanced. To take one instance that can hardly be called negligible, the Arabic words written on the outside of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem are different from any version that appears in the Quran. The situation is even more shaky and deplorable when we come to the Hadith or that vast orally generated secondary literature which supposedly conveys the sayings and actions of Muhammad, the tale of the Quran's compilation, and the sayings of the companions of the Prophet. Each Hadith, in order to be considered authentic, must be supported in turn by an iznad, or chain, of supposedly reliable witnesses. Many Muslims allow their attitude to everyday life to be determined by these anecdotes. Regarding dogs as unclean, for example, on the sole ground that Muhammad is said to have done so. My own favorite tale goes the other way. The Prophet is said to have cut off the long sleeve of his garment, rather than disturb a cat that was slumbering on it. Cats in Muslim lands have been generally spared the awful treatment visited on them by Christians, who have often regarded them as satanic familiars of witches. As one might expect, the six authorized collections of hadith, which pile hearsay upon hearsay through the unwinding of the long spool of iznads, A told B, who had it from C, who learned it from D, were put together centuries after the events they purport to describe. One of the most famous of the six compilers, Bukhari, died 238 years after the death of Muhammad. Bukhari is deemed unusually reliable and honest by Muslims, and seems to have deserved his reputation, in that of the 300,000 attestations he accumulated in a lifetime devoted to the project, he ruled that 200,000 of them were entirely valueless and unsupported. Further exclusion of dubious traditions and questionable isnads reduced his grand total to 10,000 hadith. You are free to believe, if you so choose, that out of this formless mass of illiterate and half-remembered witnessing, the pious Bukhari, more than two centuries later, managed to select only the pure and undefiled ones that would bear examination. Some of these candidates for authenticity might have been easier to sift out than others. The Hungarian scholar Ignaz Goldzia, to quote a recent study by Reza Aslan, was among the first to show that many of the Hadith were no more than verses from the Torah and the Gospels, bits of rabbinic sayings, ancient Persian maxims, passages of Greek philosophy, Indian proverbs, and even an almost word-for-word -word reproduction of the Lord's Prayer. Great chunks of more or less straight biblical quotation can be found in the Hadith, including the parable of the workers hired at the last moment and the injunction, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, the last example meaning that this piece of pointless pseudo-profundity has a place in two sets of revealed scripture. Aslan notes that by the time of the ninth century, when Muslim legal scholars were attempting to formulate and codify Islamic law through the process known as ishtihad, 
They were obliged to separate many hadith into the 